Thank you, thanks, Aditya, and thanks to Equalify for putting this together. Um, and welcome, everybody. Uh, we hope that we um, shared uh, sufficiently um, insightful uh, experiences today in respect of raising from institutional investors as LPs. Um, let me just briefly maybe spend a couple of minutes on the format of the discussion today. Um, if so, then I will keep switching between ourselves uh, uh, with respect to different topics uh, within the overall topic that uh, we Nand have. Nand Nandini, one sec. I'm sorry, but your voice uh, is not coming out properly. Uh, by any chance, have you, uh, have you, do you have two systems or two devices open? Yeah, I do have my, is, is this better? Uh, still echoing a bit. Okay. Uh, Ifshida, can you can you try talking, please? Yeah. Can you hear me properly? Yeah, much better. Yeah. So Ifshida, yours is perfect. Nandini, I mean, my request would be to switch off one device if possible. Uh, sure. Uh, is this better? Uh, to me, it's still echoing. Uh, audience, can you just quickly uh, tell Nandini on chat if she's? Uh, I mean, the voice is coming out properly. Let me rejoin. Uh, maybe it's so that you can give the outlay and I'll just uh, rejoin. Sure. Sure. So as Nandini rejoins, uh, what we have planned for today's uh, session is basically we will cover what institutional LPs uh, expect while, while they are committing to any India focus fund. And the way we have divided the discussion in the whole session is that uh, firstly, we are going to talk about what are the expectations by the institutional LPs before they actually commit to investing in any fund. We are calling them uh, pre-closing items. Second, when we when we dis after we discuss the pre-closing items and after an in uh, an institutional LP has uh, decided to commit in the uh, in the fund, we we go into what are the expectations of the institutional LPs at the closing uh, at the closing stage. At that point of time, we discuss uh, what all fund documentation, uh, what are the expectations while the institutional LP is reviewing the fund documentation. Lastly, we talk about certain post-closing items, um, certain side letter rights, which an institutional LP uh, expects uh, typically from an India focused fund, and uh, the policies which an institutional, invest, uh, institutional LP will expect and AIF to have so as to ensure that they the their investment is in compliance with their own uh, the fund documents and their own structure nandini are you back now yes uh, is my audio better yes i can hear you perfectly okay great um i i hope everybody can hear me okay super yes yes it is better now okay thank you so um I think so. I might have missed uh, Ipsita's outline, uh, but I think, uh, as she may have mentioned, uh, I'll start with uh, you know what exactly is the preparatory stage for GPs while approaching institutional investors. So, what are the initial questions that uh, institutional investors may really ask? And this is pre diligence stage. Um, so uh, possibly, uh, you know, at the pitch deck level. Um, and uh, I would request Ipsita to actually start uh, with with sharing insights on on this uh, at this stage. Sure, Nandini. So um, as a first, I think the first thing which institutional LPs uh, expects GP to communicate is whether the LP is expected to invest in a feeder vehicle or the LP is expected to invest directly at the Indian AIF level. Uh, generally, what we have seen is that institutional LPs have a preference, have their own preference in this regard. And uh, that may depend upon their own structure, uh, whether they have invested in India uh, before or not, what is the jurisdiction of the feeder vehicle that, uh, that the GP has set up. Uh, in terms of jurisdiction, we have seen uh, Singapore uh, to be very robust in terms of compliances and substance. So we have seen a lot of institutional investors being 
quite comfortable in allocating uh, towards Singapore focus funds. Um, the international financial services sector at Give City uh, Gujarat is also uh, coming up and we have seen a lot of institutional money flow to the IFSC as well. Uh, for GPs who have legacy structures uh, in Mauritius and they have been able to build appropriate substance over, over, the, uh, over the course of their operation, we have also seen G uh, such GPs continue to raise from Mauritius uh, and institutional LPs also uh, being comfortable and uh, investing in those vehicles. Um, the next, in the same structural aspect, uh, the, the decision as to whether to invest in a feeder vehicle or uh, invest directly in the domestic AIF is also driven by whether a, uh, a foreign in LP has actually invested in India before or not. Uh, more often, more often than not, if the investor would have invested in India, they would have already obtained tax registrations. They would have already submitted to the jurisdiction of India. So, in that case, we have not seen institutional LPs, uh, you know, have any problem in investing directly in the Indian AIF as well. From a domestic investor's perspective, we have seen that uh, domestic investors also want full clarity on what is the structure which which the GP is proposing. Uh, where uh, and how foreign money is going to come in because generally domestic investors also like to have all rights which the GPs offer to the foreign LPs at the feeder fund level. So uh, this is on the structural aspect on, on where to invest. Another very important aspect which LPs uh, really see clarity on is uh, whether whether the uh, GP is proposing to have a unified structure or a co-invest structure. Uh, of course, the rights which the LP will negotiate will uh, differ significantly between a unified structure and a co-invest structure. Um, in case of a co-invest structure, LPs typically expect that they should be able to enforce exit, uh, entry and exit of the by the offshore fund at the same time and at the same price at the same value at as that of the Indian fund. Because of this expectation, we have seen L, uh, LPs to require uh, you require the GPs to uh, enter into what we call a co-investment agreement, so as to ensure that there is no problem in enforceability across uh, across funds. However, we we have not been in. Uh, uh, we do not prefer the co-investment agreements generally because of uh, because of a perceived tax risk of the whole fund structure, the the offshore fund and the Indian fund being considered to be an association of uh, association of persons. So we have not uh, really uh, we have not really seen these uh, co-investment agreements uh, uh, a lot in the co-investment structures as well. So on the structural side, these are a few things which any institutional investor will expect to have clarity at the, like Nandini said, uh, at the pitch deck stage. Uh, Nandini, if you can elaborate a little bit more on the legal and the operational due diligence, which generally these institutional LPs will undertake uh, prior to them making any commitment, even a soft commitment to any, in, uh, to any fund. Sure. Thanks, Satsata. Uh, I think just to add to what you were saying around uh, the pitch deck stage, one more thing to keep in mind uh, when reaching out to investors from different jurisdiction, even if they are institutional investors, is to understand whether uh, there are any local registration requirements applicable to the GP uh, for making the pitch, uh, especially if the registrations for the potential proposed fund vehicle are not in place. So in your pitch PPT itself, there should be adequate legal protections uh, for you. Uh, LPs also look at how legally prepared are you um, and uh, you know what are the kind of um, steps that you have taken to, to give that kind of regulatory comfort to, to potential LPs. Uh, and that that uh, kind of leads us into the legal and operational due diligence stage, which is broadly the next step uh, after the LPs, institutional LPs are convinced uh, with the pitch. Uh, the, the operational diligence coming to that first uh, involves review of policies. 
so if if it's an existing fund uh, uh, rather it's if it's a seasoned manager with with existing funds in its uh, in its track record then uh, this conversation is easier and quicker because you would already have uh, at least the basic policies in place these include your conflicts policies uh, abc that's uh, anti bribery and corruption policies um, uh, investment policy, responsible investing policy, um, AML KYC policies, uh, your definition of uh, politically exposed persons, corruption, collusive practices. Uh, they would institutional investors go into that uh, much detail to understand whether uh, the policies cover everything that. Uh, are required that is required as per the internal protocols of these institutional investors. Uh, like the examples I gave, these cannot be broad guidelines. If under the ABC policy, you need to have a specific definition of what constitutes a collusive practice, for example, or what could fall uh, under the definition of bribery. Uh, what would be the meaning of kickoffs and what could be the different forms of uh, kickoffs? Uh, right, so the, these are the kind of uh, things you your operational team would need to demonstrate to institutional investors at the operational stage on the policies. Uh, like I was saying, if you ha already have funds uh, under management, uh, then institutional investors would like to understand whether these have been effective, these, ha these policies have been followed, especially the conflicts policy that comes into um, practice more often than the other policies um, and whether appropriate. So how have you identified conflicts in the past, right? What kind of situations uh, did you think had gray areas? And did you err on the side of caution or did you uh, take, a, take an aggressive call? Uh, there, there needs to be a fine balance between transparency and uh, uh, you know, rational and practical experiences or thinking uh, with respect to these these situations for institutional investors. Uh, the other thing that they do at the operational level uh, diligence is also look at uh, what kind of carry plan do you have in place. Uh, you know, if if you are a first time manager, uh, then all the more institutional investors like to understand whether you have. Uh, you know, whether you are adopting a point system or are you adopting, uh, you know, a, a annual uh, review system, what will be your uh, clawback policies, uh, what are your general employee incentive plans, who are the beneficiaries of carry, are your junior employees receiving uh, a cut of the carry. So these type of conversations also happen at the diligence stage. Uh, institutional LPs want to understand why you have adopted a particular approach to carry uh, determination and distribution uh, if, if uh, you are a first-time fund manager. And if you are a uh, subsequent fund manager, uh, uh, then in those cases, institutional investors would like to understand uh, whether there have been any uh, key departures in the past and what kind of um, you know, what kind of measures were taken on the carry front? Was there a clawback affected? Uh, there are also questions around who are being identified as key, key individuals. Uh, why them? Uh, how much importance does each key uh, individual hold? Uh, at the stage of legal diligence, which I'll come to in a minute, they also try to understand how you are positioning uh, personnel to SEBI versus how you're positioning it to them, uh, right? So that the institutional investors are quite happy with the kind of uh, changes that the regulator has been coming up with because that kind of reinforces the, uh, the regulatory robustness of the AI framework in India for them. Uh, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, what, what's the, uh, how good is the enforcement in a particular jurisdiction of fund structures. Uh, when we look at different feeder, feeder jurisdictions, that's a very important point of consideration. And here we are actually seeing uh, better enforcement 
of the law uh, by the securities market regulator in India. And that's, of course, um, quite reassuring for especially foreign institutional investors. Um, in uh, other uh, operational matters, they look at the investment policy. They would like to understand broad deal sizes. Uh, what kind of policy are you adopting for choosing deals? So what are no-goes, absolute no-goes for picking up a portfolio company? They have set uh, ESG standards uh, and they re require the manager to appoint an ESMS officer or sometimes a committee of um, uh, an ESBI committee, um, uh, which can oversee the uh, uh, preliminary due diligence reports on portfolio companies to uh, understand what are the red flags in terms of ESG. Uh, the ESMS officer will, on an ongoing basis, uh, review these compliances. But at the outset, what are your, uh, you know, clear no-nos in terms of picking up deals? Um, these could include prohibited uh, sectors, prohibited jurisdictions. Uh, this could include uh, deals like hostile takeovers. So these type of uh, investment policies and res responsible investment uh, policies are also discussed uh, by institutional investors at the operational diligence stage. Uh, in terms of legal diligence, uh, depending on the stage at which you are uh, for the fund um, formation, they may try to understand uh, whether your regulatory compliances are in place. Uh, if you are a, a new fund manager, then what kind of um, regulatory licenses are you taking not in India, but of course, overseas. In India, they like to understand why you're choosing one category over the other. Um, there, there are some uh, development finance institutions who like to see category one venture capital fund mentioned in the fund documents, and therefore they insist uh, on getting a CAT1 AIF license, even if a CAT2 uh, license is more enabling. So that that's that's also something that uh, is peculiar, but has happened. Uh, other than this, the legal due diligence includes whether you've had any disciplinary history, uh, whether any of the key personnel or senior level officers have been held liable by SEBI in the past uh, or by any other securities regulator anywhere in the world, um, whether there are any current pending cases that the LP should be aware of. Um, this All this is before the documentation stage. Uh, there are due diligence, detailed due diligence checklists sent by institutional investors for this purpose. And uh, there may be an increased level of diligence if you have politically exposed persons in the mix of things. Um, so that was just uh, uh, you know a broad overview of what happens at the diligence stage with institutional investors. Um, Ipsita, maybe you can talk about commercial diligence a little bit on what are the key fund terms that investors uh, like to discuss um, in parallel with or right before the documentation stage. Uh, also, before you start, I'll just request uh, everybody to keep asking questions uh, while we are uh, going through the subtopics because we have a lot of substance packed for this hour and uh, we we would like to make the most of it for you. So, uh, you know, one of us can keep answering questions in parallel on the chat box. Yeah. So on the commercial diligence and few of the... Uh, key fund terms which an investor would look. I think uh, what is very relevant to understand is that uh, at what stage the institutional investor is, uh, is coming uh, in the fund. The discussion is very different uh, depending upon whether the institutional investor is coming at the initial closing stage versus an institutional investor coming uh, in a subsequent closing. So let's start uh, with the initial closing, uh, with the initial closing stage. At initial closing, what we have seen, uh, hurdle and carried interest are uh, two of the most uh, 
high, most highly discussed uh, fund terms between LTs and GPs. Uh, in relation to carried interest, we have seen that uh, GPs are generally entitled to a 15 to 20% carried interest on the entire profit of the AIF, uh, where, where catch up is involved. Uh, in case there is no catch up, uh, we have seen the GPs to participate in profits of the AIF uh, right after the hurdle. So this, the 15 to 20%, uh, the percentage of carry is uh, typically negotiated and it ranges uh, between uh, this range. Um, we have also seen uh, LPs uh, negotiate carry clawback provisions quite heavily in the, in the, in the fund docs at, at initial stages. Uh, because they want to ensure that in case uh, there is any situation, for example, say a removal of manager, failure to cure any uh, key person event, the LPs want to ensure that they have sufficient uh, uh, sufficient flexibility in the documents to to get back the carry payments which has been which have been made uh, which have been made in uh, in the past to the GPs. We have also seen escrow mechanisms being adopted uh, to uh, to hold retention amounts from carried interest uh, to honor clawback carry in uh, if certain if certain situations arises. So LPs negotiate that even if even if there's an accrual of carried interest, instead of making a payout of the carried interest, the carried interest is deposited in a escrow account, which which we generally call as a retention account. And only after certain uh, certain instances or certain milestones are passed, the amount is released from this uh, retention amount. So on the carried interest side, we have seen a lot of negotiations uh, happening. In terms of uh, in terms of uh, coming to hurdle, the discussions around hurdle rate uh, generally uh, depend upon. Uh, generally revolve around whether the returns are USD based returns or INR based returns, uh, the whether the hurdle will be a pre-tax hurdle or a post-tax hurdle. We have often seen uh, there being separate hurdle rates for institutional Indian institutional investors and foreign institutional investors. We have also seen that uh, generally uh, the whether it is a pre-tax return or a post-tax return also differs uh, between uh, Indian institutional investors and foreign institutional investors. Um, the other thing which is uh, important uh, in the hurdle and uh, calculation of IRR uh, discussion, which takes place is that what is the date from which the IRR will be calculated and uh, what happens to the amounts which remain unutilized by the fund uh, what happens to the amounts which remain unutilized by the fund and uh, basically return to the LP. In such cases, we have uh, seen that LPs expect that those amounts are not accounted for while calculation of the uh, IRR on hurdle rate. So these are the two main terms where we have seen a lot of negotiations uh, taking place. Uh, apart from this, uh, the other very important uh, term which is quite often asked by uh, LPs is what will be the capital structure of the fund. Uh, now we have seen various type of cap capital, uh, capital structures. Capital structure may depend upon uh, what are the you know, different type, types of investors. A separate class may be given to Indian inv domestic investors and foreign investors. A separate class may also be given to anchor investors. Uh, we have also seen uh, there are, we have also seen separate classes of uh, uh, shares being uh, issued to investors who are onboarded on a direct uh, by a direct plan or or directly through the uh, GP network. Generally, for institutional investors, what we have noticed is that they typically invest in funds uh, through the GP network itself. So there is no intermediary uh, involved in between. Capital structure may also uh, depend upon uh, what is the currency of uh, currency of return, like we were discussing, whether it's a INR based return or a USD based returns. A few other terms which are also quite uh, important for institutional investors specifically is around uh, the uh, nature of fund in general. What are, what what will be the what will be the 
investment strategy of the fund how will the how is the manager planning to source deals what is the uh, what is the composition of lpac who all get the seat on the lpac uh, if there is a investment committee uh, at at the fund level institutional investors are also very uh, very particular to know what is the function of the uh, what is the function of the invest, investment committee what are the liabilities of the investment committee members um, apart apart from this coming to the aspect where uh, institutional investors are investing at a subsequent closing stage uh, in that case we have seen institutional lps uh, very closely evaluating the subsequent closing terms for example equalization premium amount uh, any uh, how this equalization premium amount is being computed by the manager what is the valuation method methodology which is being adopted by the manager we have also seen uh, lps ask about the portfolio composition uh, achieved by the fund so far uh, up to the stage of subsequent closing they also want to uh, know what is the percentage of corpus uh, which has been drawn down by uh, by the gp to the stage of subsequent closing um uh, again in this stage also they they few few things which are common from the initial closing stage is with respect to their uh, their due diligence not due diligence their uh, assessment of the manner of deal construction by the fund manner of the strategy of the fund uh, but the main discussion in this uh, stage revolves around uh, the equal the the compensating con the compensating contribution amounts uh, how will that be calculated and how is the fund being valued i think nandini this is all from me on the uh, pre closing fund term discussions do you want to touch upon uh, and discuss uh, what happens at a closing stage when the fund is being about to uh, be closed sure uh, thanks absuta so um, i think before we go to detailed fund documentation review um, i'll just briefly talk about uh the the concept of a side letter and what is so special about it for institutional investors so i think mostly everybody would be familiar uh with the concept uh but but still uh just to give context uh side letters are essentially um uh, specific contracts between uh one particular lp the gp and for an af that is a trust the trustee as well uh the idea behind these side letters is to modify certain rights uh that are uh, rights or liabilities that are otherwise applicable to investors as a class in the fund documents uh now uh, we uh, as we know uh, when sebi introduced the template ppm in february 2020 uh there was a disclosure requirement included in the in the term sheet section for what kind of side letter rights is the gp is the manager going to give uh what are uh, could there be any rights uh, commercial rights or non commercial rights that could cause prejudice to other investors uh there's a general undertaking to the effect that there will not be uh you have to in any case disclose indicative commercial and non commercial terms in the ppm on which you could enter into side letter uh, side letters with your investors now it's very uh, it's it's second nature for institutional investors to enter into side letters right they don't feel a closing is complete without um, entering into a side letter there is uh, immense resistance uh especially from foreign institutional investors uh towards signing uh at the documentation stage if the gp is not uh, uh willing to uh, enter into side letters and there are a bunch of reasons that i will come to for this uh but before that it's also important to understand that we have domestic institutional investors as well who have to enter into side letters for the specific terms that are being offered to them uh this is possible also through a different class structure that i think absuta was discussing but some of these institutional investors don't want to make it make their terms 
private terms public, right? But by including it in the PPM and the fund documents. Um, by public, I mean uh, disclosure to other investors, not uh, public at large. Uh, so therefore the need to have side letters. Now there needs to be a careful uh, uh, you know, review of what is being given in the side letter. You cannot modify fund level rights and obligations pursuant to a side letter. The enforceability of that may very well be in question. Uh, for example, you can't have the PPM and the contribution agreement for all investors saying that the cap for setup expenses is 1% of the corpus. And then in the side letter of an investor, you say the setup costs for the fund uh, is 0.5%. Uh, you can excuse that investor and make that disclosure in the PPM. You can give them a different class of units to track a different exp expense structure and give details of the, uh, you know, better or more uh, beneficial economic rights in the side letter. But you cannot change the fund economics in a side letter with one investor. That, that like I said, the enforceability of that may be in question. So that's something that uh, you need to keep in mind legally and contractually. Uh, the the second thing that is most important while uh, negotiating a side letter with institutional investors is that they will ask for a most favored nation provision, uh, which essentially gives them, it's a protective right for them uh, to ensure that you are not agreeing to any side letter terms or uh, similar arrangements with other investors. Uh, which give them better rights or beneficial uh, economic uh, terms for the fund than the investor signing the MFN provision. And this becomes even more relevant uh, where there are cross-border structures involved, right? Or if you have more than one fund in a fund platform. Even worse, if you have a parallel fund structure, because like Ipsita explained, you don't want to be tying in uh, uh, parallel funds uh, as a single association of persons. You have to at all times keep them distinct. Uh, so to have MFN rights that cut across is a tricky situation. Second is if even if you have a master feeder structure for Indian investors to uh, uh, to expect the Indian manager to look through the feeder and import the rights of those investors those feeder investors to apply them to the domestic investors uh, could also undermine the substance of the offshore fund or create a linkage of management between the Indian manager and the offshore fund. So you again need to be uh, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, careful about drafting these MFN provisions. Uh, there are also, uh, uh, you know, two, three uh, points for exclusions from the MFN provision, which institutional investors uh, consider non-negotiable. If there are certain um, uh, provisions that are uh, applied to them pursuant to their internal protocols, uh, then that is something they insist should not be an electable, electable provision. Uh, in fact, this works out better for the manager as well, because you don't want uh, an onerous situation for reporting or for, uh, you know, a particular format of drawdown for all investors, it will potentially increase your costs of operating the fund. Um, and the, the management is easier if, uh, you know, you distinguish between different investors on the basis of their absolute requirements as per their internal policies. Uh, this is also something that SEBI has captured in its circular on excuse rights. SEBI has clarified that you can give excuse rights to investors um, if uh, it is uh, pursuant to uh, the provisions that they've contained in their side letters for such excuse, substantiating the reasons for such excuse, such as legal reasons. Changes in law which result in excuse would also need to be notified. Uh, so this is one example of how you would like to distinguish between different uh, requirements for different investors in the side letters. 
uh, there are certain uh, representations in addition to what is contained in the fund documents that investors may also ask for uh, in the side letter. Uh, these include, uh, at the time of drawdown notice, you need to confirm that there has been compliance with the policies that the investor cleared at the time of diligence. If there are any changes to the policies, whether those have been cleared by the, uh, by the relevant institutional investor, uh, the IC minutes need to be attached to the drawdown notice. Uh, there is a specific format of the drawdown notice for some institutional investors with the calculations projected in a particular manner to the investors. Uh, so these are just the kind of things that institutional investors expect in the side letter. Uh, in, in addition to this, the general, for example, in, in Gift City or in other uh, jurisdictions, uh, which are common for setting up feeder structures, uh, there are subscription line facilities available, right, where you can, uh, instead of drawing down from investors for a particular investment, uh, take a credit facility uh, and improve the return profile for the investors uh, uh, through that arrangement. In those situations, investors are very cagey about what rights are you giving to the creditor in case of default. Right, because I as an institutional investor may not default, but you may have the demography of other investors in the fund uh, could really impact the uh, credit worthiness of the fund. Uh, and if there's a default tomorrow that leads to the fund not being able to pay the creditors uh, for the subscription facility, then I will not be required to uh, bear that deficit. Or uh, the creditors should not get a right to uh, uh, issue drawdown notices to me directly or call me a defaulting contributor directly. Uh, any of those type of uh, uh, securities given to the creditor should be cleared by me first. So these are some critical aspects uh, that are covered in terms of borrowings or um, subscription line facilities in side letters. Uh, there are also some uh, restrictions around use of name or sharing confidential information, uh, which may differ uh, not substantively, but, uh, uh, you know, even in terms of uh, the kind of restrictions, like some investors will tell you, I will not let you disclose my name uh, no matter what, whereas some may say that, okay, you may disclose my name, but not the commitment or you may disclose both with my prior approval. So there could be variations and you would like to, uh, as the GP, uh, possibly try to distinguish between different LPs and their specific requirements uh, on the basis of their internal policies, uh, their, uh, uh, their history of, uh, you know, how they have negotiated with you in the previous funds or how they, if, if you can ga gather information about what they generally uh, ask for uh, in, in funds with similar profiles. Uh, so those are just some side letter provisions. Uh, there's, uh, I think I'll just pass on the uh, discussion to Ipsita now uh, where she will cover how LPs look at different fund documents. Uh, uh, institutional investors, particularly foreign institutional investors, because the concept of a regulated private placement memorandum is not common for them. So how they look at contracts versus marketing documents and what kind of closing documents are covered. Um, over to you, Ipsita. Sure, Nandini. Uh, so I think all of us may be aware that uh, generally the fund documents which end uh, any investor looks at it is the PPM, the private placement memorandum, the management agreement, uh, the trustee, the contribution agreement, and of course the side letter. If uh, in case of institutional investors, the basic expectation for uh, the institution, which which an institutional investor has, is that all these fund document, uh, all the fund documents should be principally aligned. So there should not be a situation where one document is saying something and the other document is in conflict with that uh, 
with that document. In this regard, uh, SEBI has actually uh, specified that the terms of the contribution agreement cannot go beyond the uh, the terms uh, which we have specified in the private placement memorandum. Uh, despite this, we have seen that uh, because PPM is just a marketing document and it is not binding as such, we have seen institutional investors derive uh, comfort and uh, solely rely on the contribution agreement to uh, basically enforce their rights, determine what, what are their liabilities, what are the liabilities of the GP. Hello, am I audible? Nandini, am I audible? Yeah, you are now. Okay, you missed me in between? Yes, for a second. Sorry, I can't hear you. We missed you for a second, but you're back now. Okay, sure, sure. So I was just saying that institutional investors derive uh, uh, their comfort from uh, the contribution agreement because that is the agreement uh, which is actually binding. And of course, the side letter which they enter uh, with, the, with the manager separately. There are certain expectations by investors to ensure that the contribution agreement of all investors are similar. So generally, we have seen institutional investors take representations from manager to uh, say that all constitution, which will say that all contribution agreements uh, for the fund will be substantially similar. And generally, the expectation is to specify clauses uh, which can uh, which can differ. So those clauses can be say uh, with respect to the investment amount which the investor is being is 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 uh, committing the class of share which is being subscribed by the investor so this is one thing which in, which gives a lot of comfort to the investor because by this they can be sure that all investors are given the same rights in so far as the contribution agreement is concerned the other thing uh, the other aspects uh, in addition to fund documents which uh, which institutional investors typically ex expect at the time of closing is uh, the is a legal opinion uh, is a closing legal opinion and a tax opinion uh, a closing legal opinion is generally an opinion which is obtained uh, from the uh, gp council which will basically uh, give a opinion on the man on whether the fund is being set up uh, in a has been set up appropriately as per law uh, what whether the manager has been set up appropriately uh, as per law, uh, whether uh, is there any litigation history on the manager uh, in the past, uh, what are the enforceable rights, uh, can all are all the like are all the rights in the uh, in the fund documents appropriately uh, uh, being enforced, uh, what is the corporate status of the manager of the trustee? Uh, in what capacity and in, in what uh, power is the manager or the trustee entering into uh, these uh, in, into the fund documents? What is the validity uh, of, uh, of the fund documents? These are some of the things which uh, any investor will expect to be covered, uh, typically expect to be covered in a legal opinion. Um, in so far as the fund documents, uh, in so far as the tax opinion is concerned, Investors will typically expect the tax counsel of the manager to give an opinion um, in relation, uh, basically summarize, basically elaborating on what is the tax implication in the hands of the investor by virtue of investing in the fund. In case of AIF, for example, an AIF in India, the expectation will be to, uh, in the tax opinion, to have a detailed explanation on the pass through. Uh, provisions under the Income Tax Act, what will be the characterization of income, whether indirect transfer provisions apply or not, uh, whether the investor is required to file income tax returns, what will be the withholding uh, tax in the hands of the investors, uh, so on and so forth. So in addition to fund documents, we have generally seen these uh, two opinions being uh, required uh, by the investors at a closing stage. Uh, once the closing is done, we have also seen investors uh, uh, requiring uh, in case of MFN, uh, they also usually take the side letters for all other investors 
so that they can elect their MFN rights. Uh, that happens once the closing is done. Generally, there's a timeline which is specified in the fund document during, uh, during which the GP is expected to give all the side letters uh, to such investor. Apart from this, from a fund documentation perspective, uh, there is a there is a, there is no other document as such. Investors don't uh, generally get into the uh, the the documents which are filed by the GP for taking registration because they derive comfort from the legal opinion which is given by the GP council. Uh, Nandini, I will request you if you can talk about in addition to the fund documents and the side letter rights, what are the other policy related uh, aspects which an institutional investor typically aspect, expects a GP to cover uh, in case of an Indian focus fund? Sure. Thanks, Sipsata. So I think I briefly covered this as I was talking about different things throughout the uh, webinar. But um, I will uh, lay, uh, you know, more emphasis on uh, the the policies that are required under the AIF regulations and also required by institutional investors. Um, and like I was saying in the beginning, conflicts policy is one of the most critical uh, policies in this respect. Um, you know, we often see in the fund documents that a conflict clearance mechanism involves going to the LP advisory committee or the advisory board, whatever uh, you call it in your fund documents. Uh, but it is important to understand that uh, each member of the LP advisory committee acts for itself and not for the fund investors uh, as a whole. They don't owe a fiduciary to other fund investors. They can't be held accountable. So uh, when you are going to them for conflict clearance, it should not be taken as a, a sure shot um, protection from any potential liability um, around uh, a conflict that should not have been waived. Um, right. Also, there are no uh, checks and balances. Uh, if if there are no checks and balances in place for exclusion of interested parties, uh, especially in the LPAC, uh, then also there is uh, there is some discomfort. So you need to demonstrate in your conflicts policy to institutional investors, uh, especially how uh, uh, you know you are going to look at different conflict situations, how you are going to exclude interested. Uh, members of the LPAC, how you will ensure uh, adequate uh, review of conflict processes by the LPAC, given that they act only for each member acts only for themselves. Uh, and we've seen institutional investors asking for specific situations as examples in the conflicts policy. And what will be the steps to, to waive those uh, conflicts? Uh, for example, we've seen a situation where, uh, uh, you know, the members, uh, the, the manager was dealing with, uh, you know, a, a conflicting uh, service that it was providing to uh, certain other clients who were not funds, in addition to being the fund manager. There was, a, uh, there was an argument made by the fund manager that these are unrelated services, and therefore, uh, there shouldn't be a conflict. Uh, however, investors went into institutional, there were three to four institutional investors who came together and went into, uh, you know, very detailed discussions of uh, what are the services that you're rendering to these other clients, show us the service agreements, uh, why should we not be worried about, uh, uh, you know, the same portfolio companies in which we are investing uh, uh, somehow being related to the to the other clients that uh, you are kind of providing services to. Uh, so there, there can be requests for putting special examples uh, in the conflicts policy. 
uh, other than this, the KYC AML policy is expected to be quite robust by institutional investors. If, if I, as an institutional investor, am putting my name on your capital structure, your fund's capital structure, I need to know that everybody else that you're admitting into the fund uh, comes from a, uh, a jurisdiction that is not um, you know, under any increased monitoring by FETF or is not considered uh, a very high risk jurisdiction um, uh, internationally by any recognized, um, uh, you know, bodies, internationally recognized bodies. Um, there are requirements uh, to, to actually revise uh, your KYC, uh, in, the KYC information that you have, um, um, sometimes more frequently than the law requires. Uh, there is also um, emphasis on the valuation policy that the funds are going to adopt, especially in cases where it's a secondary fund um, uh, and you are buying from your own previous fund. Uh, there are uh, clear guidelines um, to be envisaged uh, at the time of signing around the valuation, uh, the principles for valuation that you're adopting, uh, the, the extent of disclosure of the valuation that will be made to investors, whether you're going to verify the valuation through independent sources um, once or twice. Uh, this, is, this also becomes relevant in cases where investors are participating at a subsequent closing. Um, and they are expected to pay an equalization premium um, on their existing uh, on the existing investments of the fund because there has been a bumper performance by some of the portfolio. So uh, these are just um, some of the policies. Um, uh, what I initially discussed was also the ESG policy under which you may set up an ESBI panel and. Uh, uh, this panel would generally consist of investors um, who have an internal policy requirement to uh, uh, have this policy been constituted. Uh, we've seen a situation where the foreign investors had constituted this committee under their side letters on their own. This was not a committee set up by the fund or the manager. It was not formulated in any of the fund documents, including side letters. Just two or three institutional investors at the feeder level came together and formed a committee. Uh, uh, and the domestic investors found out about it and insisted uh, that the manager make them also a member on this panel. And the manage, manager had to keep defending the position, saying they have not constituted the panel. They have no rights to membership on the panel or force any LP to be a, a member on the panel. So uh, uh, it's important to ensure that if uh, there are any LP expectations around creation of some panels or committees, then uh, these are excluded from the fund documents um, or rather they are not mentioned in the fund documents if they are not intended to be uh, at the fund level or at the manager level. Uh, if it's a purely LP driven initiative, then they can very well cover it in their own arrangements um, that they have among each other. Um, so yeah, that's that's just, I think um, I have given an example of the conflict policy. I think there, uh, there was a question uh, around that. One more thing that you need to keep in mind for the conflict policy is allocation of costs. And there have been case laws around this uh, where, uh, you know, fund, fund managers, not, not in India, overseas, uh, particularly in the Cayman Islands, where uh, uh, the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority has uh, hauled up a manager for misallocating costs between different funds that were investing in the same portfolio, deal, uh, broken deal costs, uh, diligence costs uh, were not equitably allocated between different funds. Uh, and uh, the, this was considered as a huge governance red flag. Uh, so these are just, I think, some examples. And uh, we are at the five o'clock mark. Uh, so I'll stop here. Uh, we'll give five minutes for any 
further questions, unless Satsuta, you would like to add something more. No, I think we have answered quite a few questions uh, on chat, but in case there are any further questions, uh, we'll be happy to take. I'll just put down both of our email addresses if there are questions that come to you later uh, or that you would like to discuss offline, uh, then you can write to one or both of us uh, and we'll be happy to discuss. Uh, thanks, Soumya, uh, for asking this question. Um, so procedurally, the items covered uh, in the LPAC charter include uh, frequency of meetings, uh, whether the manager will get the right to attend these meetings and in what situations will they be forcefully uh, kept out. Um, substantively, the uh, LPAC charter includes, uh, uh, you know, broad guidelines for uh, con uh, for uh, reviewing proposals, uh, for understanding, uh, uh, for for gathering information, for reporting. Uh, there are clear, uh, uh, you know, delineation of responsibilities and liabilities. Uh, the LPAC charter typically clarifies that uh, no LPAC member will have a fiduciary obligation uh, to each other or to the fund and will be indemnified uh, unless they act in bad faith uh, or engage in some identified bad acts. Uh, and of course, these are uh, uh, these are to be proven in a court of competent jurisdiction for indemnity to be taken away from them. Um, I hope that answers it. Um, Pradnya has a question around uh, different strategies being managed, say private equity and private debt, uh, whether there can be a conflict. Yes, there can be a conflict in terms of uh, allocation of time. If this, first of all, right, if the same, uh, head or same uh, members are uh, identified as key persons in both the funds. Both of the, the same person is required to uh, allocate substantial amount of their business time uh, to two conflicting strategies. So how are you going to reconcile that? Um, there, are, uh, there are situations where uh, managers exclude uh, funds with different strategies from the key person event provisions to avoid this uh, issue and get make adequate disclosure in the fund documents uh, to, to address this, this issue. There can also be um, issues around diligence. Like I said, allocation of costs around diligence. Uh, there may be overlaps um, if, if uh, you are allocating uh, equity in the same company through one fund and you are taking up debt in the same company from another, there may be overlap in terms of diligence. So to that extent, are you equitably allocating costs among the two funds? Uh, if there are cross transactions between the two funds, uh, then, there, then again, there can be conflicts and you are required to make appropriate disclosures to investors um, and possibly get a clearance from LPAC if uh, if you feel that this could create problems in the future. Uh, so yeah, these are just some examples on how you can best manage it. The ideal size of LPAC uh, really differs from fund to fund. Typically we see that uh, Everybody holding more than 15% in the fund gets an LPAC seat. 
uh, institutional investors insist that even if they are not holding 15%, they come with a strategic value to the fund and therefore they should they should get an LPAC seat uh, because they can add value uh, in terms of experience and competence. So it, it it's highly factual. Kushbu. So, um, you know, it's it's not something new. Uh, the prorating of rights between uh, investors for distributions was, uh, uh, you know, somehow always uh, uh, provided by SEBI uh, in vague terms in the previous circulars. But while reviewing PPMs, uh, they looked at it quite uh, minutely. There were certain debt funds in which a priority distribution model uh, was included. Uh, and I think there may have been commercial misunderstanding of how it is going to work out. Uh, so this is not an entirely new concept for most of the AIFs out there. Uh, it particularly impacts debt funds. Uh, and this is just a consultation paper, right? So we don't know exactly how it is going to come out in the law. Uh, there will be uh, uh, commercial inputs provided uh, in cases where it is absolutely essential to have a disproportionate sharing of losses. Um, in terms of um, misuse, um, I think that's really a matter of, uh, uh, you know, facts and circumstances for each case. There can be misuse even if you have adequate clarity in law. Uh, those are just my views. Uh, if, if you have something to add, uh, please do. No, no, nothing to add on the uh, Florida rights for LPs. I think there's another question on uh, typical carry structures among the partners and the team. Uh, I think we have seen a lot of carry structures uh, on uh, between the partners and the team. And this again will depend upon whether this is a unified structure, it's a co-invest structure, or whether it's just a domestic uh, AIF. In case of a pure domestic AIF, we have seen um, if there's a key senior personnel, uh, we have also seen instances wherein the personnel has been admitted in the fund as a LP so that the uh, person can get uh, carry directly from the fund. Uh, we have seen instances where um, the manager distributes carry in form of bonus payouts or uh, salary to its uh, uh, to its employees. We have seen cases where uh, uh, EWT, the uh, Employee Welfare Trust, has been set up by the manager, um, wherein wherein the manager provides for a detailed vesting schedule on how many years a person will have to work before carry can accrue to that person, how the accrual will happen. When will the payout happen? We have also seen those type of structures. So there is a lot of there are a lot of uh, ways in which uh, carry it may be structured between uh, the GPs and the team, and uh, it a lot of it actually depends on what is the commercial requirement. Uh, even uh, say even for setting up of EWT, we generally recommend setting up of EWT from a very long term perspective. It's not uh, feasible to just set up. Uh, EWT say for two or three employees, if we see from a very long term perspective that uh, there are quite a few number of employees, there is carry coming from multiple vehicles, then probably EWT would make sense. Uh, similarly, we, we generally don't like uh, management uh, people related to the GPs to be to become directly to, be, to come as investors directly in the fund because there may be issues with respect to uh, the same person wearing uh, LP hat and and the same person being associated with GPs. So carry will how the carry will be shared between the partners and the team really depends a lot on what is the commercial requirement and what the GP wants to exactly achieve. I hope that answers the question.
That's right. Um, there needs to be a sufficient investment to demonstrate uh, a proportionate return uh, rather than a highly disproportionate uh, return. We also see that upfront issuance of carry units helps uh, rather than uh, taking that decision at the time that carry has started accruing. Uh, to clarify, you're talking about uh, carry being passed on to Indian uh, individuals or uh, carry beneficiaries from an offshore fund? Okay. Uh, it's so that do you want to take that up? Sorry, I cannot see that question, Nandini. Uh, so the question is, if how from a tax perspective can Indian uh, carry beneficiaries uh, receive carry from an offshore fund? Okay, so I think this will again uh, depend upon how, uh, actually this is more of a regulatory question than a tax question. Firstly, we'll have to figure out a way for the Indian uh, carry beneficiary to uh, hold some stake in the offshore carry vehicle or the offshore fund to get carry. Uh, because of the recent changes in the foreign exchange rules, uh, investment by an Indian individual in a financial services uh, uh, entity outside India has become uh, is not is not possible unless the entity itself is a regulated uh, fund in that overseas jurisdiction. So, depending on that, uh, we'll have to see whether the person can get carry or not. In case whether carry is received in uh, as a return on investment in uh, that the taxation should be similar to uh, any like because this carry beneficiary is a person resident in India taxation should be similar to taxation of any other capital gains which is being earned by the resident so for uh, long term capital gain on unlisted uh, shares the, res the resident will pay a 20% tax if it is if the carry is being distributed as a return on investment in case uh, there is any other arrangement or say a service fee arrangement or a consulting fee then it will be uh, the the income will be taxed at the applicable slab rate of the individual Yeah, so I think there's another question, Nandini, uh, wherein uh, it's been asked that for a gift fund as it's a regulated, as it's regulated locally, investment from Indian IM team is possible. Um, when you say investment from Indian IM team, I'm assuming the question is whether individuals can invest in a gift fund. Uh, yes, individuals can invest in a gift fund that will be considered to be a overseas portfolio investment. Uh, there is so on the round technically legally there is no round tripping concern however we have seen IFSCA the authority at GIF City not being comfortable with GIF funds raising money from Indian investors and the fund investing back in India so legally and technically speaking there is no round tripping concern but practically we have seen IFSCA not being comfortable with this Nandini, if you have anything to add on this. Uh... No, that's right. Uh, uh, IFSCA is discussing with the Reserve Bank of India for more clarity because they feel that uh, the new rules are not as clear as uh, practitioners possibly feel they are. No worries. I, I think uh, we are uh, 
15 minutes of mark, uh, but um, it was great uh, to get all the questions and have a meaningful discussion. Uh, thank you to all the participants for joining us. Uh, we hope to stay in touch. Uh, Shreya, I am not too sure. Uh, maybe you could check with eQualify. Uh, this has been recorded. I can see that uh, there should be a recording. Yes, Nandini, this has been rep recorded. The session has been recorded. Okay. So, uh, Shreya, you could check with eQualify. I, I think they may be able to share. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll log off now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.